Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 447, interview with T. Martin Bennett about his book, Wounded Tiger, the inspiring true story of the pilot who led the Pearl Harbor attack, whose life was changed by an American prisoner and by a girl he never met. Mr. Bennett covers the amazing intertwined stories of Mitsuo Fuchida, the lead pilot in the Pearl Harbor attack, Jake DeSager, captured during the Doolittle raid and made to suffer for his desire for revenge, and Peggy Coville. Though she lost much in the war, her work in trying to forgive the Japanese would impact Fuchida and change the rest of his life. Mr. Bennett, thank you very much for being with us today. Ray, it's great to be with you. So, so excited. I just finished reading your book. I do have to say, I did read somewhere where someone was so caught up in it that they read it, they read it in one sitting. I didn't do that, but I did read it in two sittings. It's that engaging. I, uh, this is my, yeah, just your style. We're going to go into all this, but your style, the way you wrote, and of course, the facts themselves uh, were just very intriguing. Normally, when I do, when I have someone on who's written a book and there's a decent chance it's going to be turned into a movie, you know, I joke with them and I say, let me know when you're shooting the film. I'll carry your luggage. I'll drive your car. I'll do craft services, whatever, whatever you need. I just want to be on the set because how could that not be amazing, right? But you've already beat me to the punch because your book is already in the process of becoming a film. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So Wounded Tiger is the true story of the pilot who led the attack in Pearl Harbor whose life was changed by an American prisoner and by a girl he never met. Mm -hmm. So I I originally came across some of these facts of this guy's life, which I'd never heard before. I like history like you. I mean, I'm the guy who stops at all those metal signs on the side of the road and blocks traffic. (laughs) I got to read the sign, you know? So uh, I come across this story. I'm thinking, how is that I don't know this story? And the the more I went into it, the the better it got. I thought, golly, this is is a full-on movie. Right. I'd already written a feature length screenplay on the life of another true story. And I thought I, I I already knew I had the instincts of what it would take to do this thing. But I was kind of scared because I thought, golly, this is a big, this is a heavy lift. Yeah. I really didn't know uh, a lot, Japanese culture, Japanese history. I didn't know the Japanese side of what led up to that, to, to them attacking Pearl Harbor. But when I, the more I came across, the better the story got. And honestly, Ray, I mean, you said you read it in two days. I've had many people tell me they've read it you know, in one sitting, some people uh, read it like two, three times. One guy told me he read it seven times. He read the book front to back. Right. So, it, it, so it did take me a while. But but what's backwards about the story is that I wrote the screenplay first, uh-huh. and then uh, I novelized to book form. So the short story on what happened with that is, although I had received offers to do the film, I'm not a control freak. I'm not a micromanager. Right. But I wanted to be in a position where I can protect the integrity of the story. I don't want it to be a Hollywood version of the truth. I've worked hard and long to get the facts straight. Right. The last thing I want is some goofy Hollywood version. So I declined those offers. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, about a couple of years ago, the producer of Hacksaw Ridge contacted me. Someone had tipped him off about the project. And he said, what's going on with the film side? So I explained... Uh, that I, you know, I had, you know, the issue of creative control, mm-hmm. but I had, but the producers who had one group, they had funded a an Oscar winning film and they thought it was just extremely commercially viable. They felt wounded tiger. This is going to make a ton of money. Right. But I couldn't take that offer. He said, Martin, you've got the book, get the book to the top of the charts. That's when the investors will come to your side of the table. So uh-huh. I basically shifted my focus from film funding to getting book funding. And eventually we did get a, an investor to come on board. And uh, that's funding this national offer, excuse me, national campaign, which mm-hmm. is happening right now. And that's, you know, people can read the first chapters free at woundedtiger.com. But the goal was essentially to bring the audience on board to validate uh, the story for the investors. Because I've gotten so many reviews over the years, Ray, I mean, over a thousand reviews. Right. And many people will say, Love the book. Where's the movie? I mean, that's just pretty common. Did you feel that way when you read it, Eric? Absolutely, right? absolutely. No, it, it it was. I I could tell it was an unfolding, well told story. And then when all the the effects of the we're going to get into this, but when the effects of the characters start to influence each other, that that gave it a synergy and inner you know twining, if you will. That, like you said, it was an incredible story that just kept going. Yeah. Uh, so I say a good story is like a good roller coaster. Mm-hmm. 
first somebody tells you you got to get on this roller coaster. <laughs> I mean, I remember taking my kids to what was at the time the supposed to be the best roller coaster in the USA. Right. And I thought, okay, we're going to go on this thing. But then what happens is you see it from a distance. You can see that thing up in the air and think, oh, dude, this this looks kind of amazing. So you know, when people see the book, the first thing they notice when they flip this is, man, I've never seen a book like this with hundreds and hundreds of photos. Like that's very unusual. Right. And then uh, you know, when you're on the roller coaster, you're on that part where you're going up the ramp. The click, 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 <laughs> click, click. So as a, as a storyteller, what those clicks are? Yeah. Those are setups of like, oh man, what's going to happen with this? And what? Where is this going? And how is he going to? And all these questions. And then you get the first drop of, oh man, this is unbelievable. Right. Lots of twists and turns. And right when the roller coaster, you're like, okay, it's over. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. It's not over. Right. So at the end of the story, really, where it seems like it's all going to wind down, yeah. it starts winding back up. Right. You think, well, where is it going now? And then you know, I've had many people say, you know, I mean, for me personally. Right. A good story is unpredictable. Mm-hmm. If I'm watching a movie and I know how it's going to, what's I'm going to say, well, the guy's obviously going to do this and he does that. Pretty soon I start checking out. I'm not engaged anymore. Right. I, I, I know what's going to happen. With this story, I, I would think, I remember when I'm going through it, I'm thinking, well, either A, B, or it's going to happen, maybe C. But when D happens, I'm going, all right. I am definitely in for the ride. What is going on? Did you feel that way, Ray? Absolutely. No, um, t- t- for the listeners, um, it's well-crafted, it's well-written, but it's well put together as well. You're right. It absolutely does build. It has pitfalls. It builds back up again. You have no idea where it's going, and I think that's probably one of the reasons I would sit for like, I think it was yesterday I sat for like four hours straight. And as far as everything that you've just said, I have two responses to that. One, it sounds like I still have a chance to carry your luggage for you one day on a movie set. Pretty excited about that. Uh, But second of all, you said that you did not know much about Japanese culture. Well, clearly you overcame that because by the time I finished reading your book, I so much better understood their perspective, their point of view, the decisions they made, and they themselves knew the risks that everything had to work out perfectly for them or it was not going to end well. Yeah, so, you know, remember the old Paul Harvey radio shows, and now the rest of the story. Exactly. Exactly. I love those things. Well, that's what you'll see in Wounded Tiger. It's like we all know the black and white footage, Pearl Harbor, the Dirty Japs, and America showed them who's boss, and we we beat the Japs, we won. The end. Yeah. But it's like I remember being in high school and asking my teacher, what what were they doing? What were the Japanese thinking? They're trying to take over the country? What? I don't get this whole thing at all. Right. And when I started researching the Japanese side, I found there was not a lot of information out there. I did find one book written by a Japanese author who was a professor at their uh, Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. I tracked him down. I asked if I could meet with him. I flew to Japan. I met with him for a full day, just asking him questions all day long. He spoke English, fortunately, because I don't speak any Japanese. Right. We went to three different uh, different museums, and he was explaining all kinds of stuff. And every question I had, he, he understood and he could answer it. So at the end of the day, I thought, oh, wow, now I get what was going on, the big picture. I could see it. But then I had to figure out how do I make this distilled enough that I can fit it into a screenplay and then later the same thing for the book. But ultimately, it did work out. And regarding your story about reading the book yesterday, mm-hmm. I remember I had a podcaster who I sent the book to, and she said, Martin, I don't have time to read a book like this. I said, you don't need to read the book. Just flip through here and there. We'll do fine. She goes, well, that's that's what I'm going to do, but I am definitely not reading the book. I said, you don't need to read the book. <laughs> right. So, of course, you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. So about two days before the, the interview, she said, Martin, I sat down on Saturday morning and started to read this book, and I started reading and reading and reading. She said, Martin, I did not get out of my chair till the sun went down. This is one unbelievable story. I've never read a book like this before. Yeah. So... Uh, interestingly, a footnote that you would get a kick out of is uh, some years later, she said, hey, Martin, my husband's ex-girlfriend from high school went on to be the script supervisor for Clint Eastwood. Do you want me to put you in touch? I said, of course. Yeah. So she put me in touch with this woman. And uh, I said, can I mail you a copy of the script? She said, sure. Now, I live in a small town in central Tennessee, Franklin, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I get her mail address and uh, she lives down the street. <laughs> <laughs> so I drove to her house and put it in the mailbox, and I later met with her in her home, met with her in a restaurant, and uh, she said, Martin, I wouldn't say this if it wasn't true, but you are a great writer. This is a great script, and she she really liked it a lot, but she said, hey, Clint Eastwood would not do this. He's just too old. This is too much for him. I wasn't asking for anything. I just would like sure. to get her 
feedback. So anyway, getting back to this podcaster who said, I don't have time for book. I've seen this happen over and over. It's not yeah. seen it happen so many times. Yeah, I missed dinner last night because of you. So you might have to answer to my wife, but we'll go into that later off here. Well, no. I've got blamed for lots of things. One guy <laughs> told me, I am falling asleep at work today. It's your fault. Right. Yeah. No, because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on caffeine right now, again, because of you. So thank you. So let's jump into this. So what your story reminded me of, and, and you know, because war is a huge, vast, complex thing, but one of the things that war does, whether it's a big world war or a local war, is that it changes the trajectories of people's lives. It certainly did for Jacob DeShazer in your book. He's someone who has a humble beginning. He's struggling like everybody else in America, everybody else in the world. He's trying to put two dimes together. Because of events, he ends up in Asia. He ends up as a POW. Could you maybe introduce him and the other main characters to, to us, please? Yeah, so just as an overview, the, the, the story of Wounded Tiger has three plot lines. J, uh, excuse me, uh, Mitsuo Fuchida was handpicked by Admiral Yamamoto to lead the Pearl Harbor attack. Mm. Uh, he was motivated by selfish ambition, national ambition. Uh, and that's about 50% of the story. Then there's a guy named Jacob DeShazer, Jake DeShazer. He was a, a guy just trying to find his way in the world, like you described. Yeah. You know, and, you know, if you can't get a good job, hey, join the Army. You know, that's what he did. Right. And it, that was before Pearl Harbor. He volunteered for a mission. He ended up in the U.S. Army Air Corps, which was a precursor to the Air Force. Uh, he volunteered on this mission. And the way he volunteered, as you know in the story, he didn't want to go on this mission. <laughs> he was... He was just too embarrassed to say, I'm not going to go, because everybody else said they're going. He didn't want to be the one guy who says, I'm chickening out. So he got kind of sucked into this deal that really was like, oh, my goodness. The chances of of making it back alive were, like, close to zero. Right. So he ends up on this mission, and he bombs Japan. His plane runs out of fuel. He bails out over occupied China. He becomes a prisoner of war, torture, solitary confinement, just horrific living circumstances. And as you read the story, you're thinking, okay— where is this going? Right. I don't even see where this goes. But his, he's a funny guy. He, he had a funny sense of humor. But then you start seeing kind of supernatural things happen. I think, golly, this is kind of a crazy story. I, I want to just see what happens next with this guy's life. Right. And then the third plot line are the Covells. They were highly educated teachers from the Chicago area. They uh, went to Japan as missionaries. They wanted to bring the good news of Christ to people, but they also loved the Japanese people. Mm -hmm. They served them. The the poorest of the poor, they went out there. I couldn't put everything in the book because it would get too long, but for you to know what's not in the book is people, the poor people would come to their house almost every day to their front door asking for food. Right. And they would give out these tickets, and they would just feed these people, and they would help people. So, I mean— I mean, the world's tired of, of religion and people just wanting to make get rich. You know, I need to buy a fourth jet. And right. I, I heard this, literally, I heard this like this week. This guy's talking about he needs a fourth jet. And people come, what is wrong with these people? How, what is, that's not serving other people. Right. What are you doing? So with, with all I'm saying was with the Covells, they were authentic. They were real. They were, they were the real deal. And this guy was a pacifist. I mean, he would not even pick up a gun. Yeah. And so he ends up fleeing with his family to the Philippines, then sending their children off the U.S. And that's kind of sets up the plot lines. But as far as Jake DeShazer, he's just a guy trying to find his way in the world. But once the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, like every red-blooded American male, oh, those dirty Japs, are, they, well, I'm a, I want revenge. I'm going to exactly. pay these guys back. Send me over there. I will kill Japs. Right. That's what he wanted to do. And that was understandable. But once he got over there and it, 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 everything flipped upside down where he was at their beck and call and, you know, given rotting, rotting fish and maggot infested rice and dying. And he was literally dying. Uh, you try you start. It, it makes you think about what are you living for? And what happened with Jake to finish the, my thought here mm-hmm. is yeah. he, he said in his own words, he was crazy with hatred. And he didn't want to live that way. And he thought, I, you know, and, and of course, in his mind, is he would die that way as well. He thought there's got to be a better way to live. And I think that's a good question for anyone to ask. Absolutely. And and you you mentioned earlier that this was a roller coaster. Not only was it a, ro- a roller coaster, but it was an emotional roller coaster. Because when you first introduce Fuchida to us, you make it very clear he's not crazy about you know America. He's not he's not crazy about the American uh, arrogance, the riches, certainly the Christianity. We're going to go into 
to that. But when I was reading the letters, when, when Jacob DeShazer goes on the Doolittle Raid, he disappears. They don't know where his family doesn't know where he's at for a while. Heck, the army doesn't know where he's at for a while. So when Doolittle himself writes a letter to Jacob's family back home, I mean, it was just, it was just devastating. But that, but he, I, I guess he felt like he owed it to the parents and the families. Look, these, these young guys did something very dangerous and most of them, you know, probably didn't come back or whatever, but he wanted, he wanted to acknowledge their courage and their bravery. Yeah, he was, he was, uh, he took personal responsibility for these guys' lives and he felt horrible for any of them. Now, some died on the night of the attack because a plane crashed, landed in the water, some men drowned, Uh, others were executed, Uh, but most of them did make it back. But Jake DeShazer's, his uh, his whereabouts were unknown until the very end of the war, and his. The, I mean, uh, I mean, Jimmy Doolittle was was a a stellar guy for what he did. Uh, the world, you know, they say they called the uh, they called the greatest generation mm-hmm. that went into World War II. They just had a, a higher standard of love and care for for their fellow man. Absolutely, and. Um... Because you, this book goes into so much detail, we spend time in Tokyo, we spend time in, uh, in uh, Yokohama, we spend time in the Philippines, we spend time out in the American West. Um, so by the time I finish this, I feel like I understood these these various areas very well, but I'm um, I can only guess at the amount of research and maybe even travel that you had to go through. So could you tell us about? How did you go about learning about all of these these people and the details in their lives? Well, first of all, Ray, I'm a visual thinker. So when they're talking about being somewhere mm-hmm. in the Philippines, I'm like, well, wh- where is that? I don't know where that is. <laughs> right. you know, me and Google Earth became best friends. <laughs> I'm like, where is this place? Like, it's a little tiny island. Well, where is this island? I, I had no idea. Right. And then I started to drill down into the information. And of course, with the advent of the internet today, I mean, you, if you want to find something out, you can find it. It's there somewhere. But it does take a lot of digging. But the cool thing was that it just fleshed out the story for me. And you know, you ask about how I engaged into these into the lives of these people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jake DeShazer was in a B-25 bomber. And I thought, you know, I'd really like to get into one of those things because that would really tell me what it's like. But I really didn't have the money to do it. But then I saw in the newspaper that there was an air show at a local uh, air base and they were going to have a B-25 bomber and you can just get passage on one. So wow. that's exactly what I did. I got on one of these planes and you've probably been to World War II air shows before, but they have this kind of silly uh, disclaimer you got to sign. It says, basically... This plane is a piece of junk. It could crash. You could die. Good luck. It's not our fault. <laughs> right. We, we hope That's my best. translation. So I'm trying this thing and thinking, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm thinking this is going to be a fun ride. But, you know, I've been at air shows where planes did crash right. and blow up in flames. You, yes. know? you may have been at one, too. It's not that uncommon. Exactly. Exactly. Sure. Yep, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So you introduced us to the main characters, Fuchita, DeShazer, uh, the, the, the family. Um Going back to the idea that war changes people's trajectories, it changes the path that they're on. Um, but again, so you, it's, it's the presentation that really got me, that, that kept me glued. It kept me turning the pages. And again, it was almost like you, and, and I say this a lot to, uh, to other authors, it's almost like you Quentin Tarantino'd it. You, 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 you merge the timelines together. And so it starts out as three stories and it quickly becomes, you know, a lot closer together because they're affecting each other. But could you give us an idea of the transformation of Fuchida? Could you give us an idea about DeShazer? Because they have very intense negative they're in very dark places in their heads for for different reasons whether it's culture whether it's because of the attack on Pearl Harbor but they do go through a a transformation if you will if you could maybe touch on that a little bit for us please yeah that's a really good question as an author and as a screenwriter I studied the art and craft of storytelling and screenwriting at great length I read many books because I really wanted to have a good working knowledge of how all that works together and in in storytelling, there's a thing called a character arc. You know, there's there's a, something that he wants. There's a, there's obstacles between him and achieving that. Uh, there's turning points, and then there's a climax where he either gets it or doesn't get it, etc. 
But in the in the story of Puchita, there's actually two character arcs. I mean, I plotted it out on paper because what happens is he changes his trajectory. So what he wanted was he he was selfishly ambitious for for being a career military guy, you know, wearing those cool uniforms and having the women faint, you know, oh, when yeah. you walk by with your sword and all that. I mean, he he was into all that. Uh, he wanted his nation to be a powerful, respected nation like Great Britain, like France, the United States, Germany. He wanted their nation to be like mm-hmm. that. But their their pathway to it through uh, aggressive war uh, was it was it was a colossal failure and disaster for the nation, re- resulting in the deaths of millions of people in Japan and outside Japan. And he felt like a, a failure. And of course, at the end of the war, you know this, but a lot of people listening may not. A lot of Japanese officers just killed themselves. Yes. They just they just checked out completely because they couldn't face the shame of having been a defeated warrior. So in Japanese philosophy, you either fight and win or you fight and die. But there is no surrender. They don't that's not part of their equation in war as a warrior. So what happened with, with Buchida was he 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 comes across this story of Jake DeShazer because he loves he, he respected um well, he loves the military, and he respected the Doolittle Raid, which was this group of 16 B-25 mm-hmm. bombers bombed Japan. He thought, man, that was ballsy you know, to do that. That took a lot of guts to just fly all the way in. And how they evaded the uh, um, their uh, fighters was that they flew so low to the ground, you could barely see them from if you're up in right. the air. 10,000 feet, 15,000 feet. It's hard to see one of those planes. Of course, they were painted green. And uh, so they, they they did the whole thing. He respected him. So when he came across an article about Jake DeShazer, he thought, okay, I want to see what he has mm-hmm. to say. Well, he talks about hating his enemies and then eventually loving his enemies to the point of wanting to come back and live in Japan. He thought, well, okay, what, what is that all yeah. about? He read his book. He wanted to find out what a Bible was. He wasn't interested in Christianity or religion or God, nothing, not that at all. He just wanted to know, uh, why would you love your enemies? And this was a, another part, That's this is where the Covell plot line mm-hmm. comes in. Peggy Covell, and you know the story, but without giving it away, she does something that's kind of outrageous in Fuchita's mind. And how that story comes to Fuchita is like millions <laughs> to one odds of how yes. that happened. Yes. So he finds out what she did. And he just becomes obsessed with the question, where does this love come from? Why would you love your enemies? I don't understand. And I think that is the answer to that question is relevant to the world today. People are still fighting and killing each other as they have done for thousands of years. And will do probably for as long as mankind is on this planet, they'll be killing each other. However, we'd all like to know, is there a better way to solve this problem? Is there something better than just killing each other? And when you see... Puchita's pathway, without being a religious person, you see that he was just hunting for the truth. And I think that is a thing that most people can relate to of like, hey, if it's true, it's true. You know, let's live according to what's true and see where it leads us. And that's what happened with Puchita. So to answer your question, his, his life trajectory changed. He was a farmer after the war with no future at all, other than being oh, you're one of those guys who destroyed our country. Thanks a lot for nothing. I mean, they really were despised by the public, and they despised themselves. But when this ray of light comes in of, hey, why do people love their enemies? I just am curious. It takes you on a different journey that's actually quite amazing. Yeah, Yeah, I love the story arc, because like you said earlier, it was unpredictable. I did not see that happening for him. But I do want to let the World War II buffs out there know that when you pick up this book, you go into great detail about the planning for Pearl Harbor and the planning for Midway and the execution. So I want people to know that, yes, this is a human interest story, and it's the story of change and courage and finding some reason to live when the one that you did live for has been taken from you. Uh, But it also has a lot of the military details in there that a lot of people are looking for us. So I, I just wanted to make that clear. But so he, he, um, you start out the book with him and, and he's, and he's just so angry and he, the culture that he grew up in, which was heavily influenced by America and Great Britain was life is a zero sum game. You have to take from everybody else or they're going to take from you. And through a lot of pain, he learns there's a different way to live his life. You can try to get along with your fellow man and you can both benefit from sharing versus tearing the other person down before they tear you down. Yeah. Uh, Fuchita's story is is an amazing story of discovery, and to kind of discover it with mm-hmm. 
is a journey that's really, really rewarding. Uh, I found it just fascinating. Uh, I, I mean, I love history. I'm the guy who, if I go to a museum, I'm there like all day <laughs> because I want to read every right. card. And then I got to pull the curator over and say, well, what exactly, you know, and I'm starting to ask him questions. So one thing in this story, Ray, which you saw, which I knew nothing about, was the racial equality proposal, which was really part of what fomented war between Japan and the United States. So for those listening, after World War I in 1919, uh, the nations of the world put together the League of Nations. I think there's 26 or 27 founding nations, Japan being mm -hmm. one of them. And this is the precursor to the United Nations. And the, the goal was to figure out a way to solve differences without going into war, because World War I, besides yeah, taking so many hundreds of thousands, millions of lives, it didn't do anything. Right. I mean, the borders all were all the same. It was just like a complete waste of everything. So it, it was a, not a bad idea necessarily. But what happened was the Japanese contingent, they said they put forth the racial equality proposal, which... Uh, a lot of the nations agreed with that, yeah, all nations are equal. Mm -hmm. They're equal in race, no no difference, uh, race, culture, language, etc. But there were some nations who said, no, that's absolutely not true. There are superior races and inferior races. So the head of the League of Nations was the President of the United States, Woodrow right. Wilson, which, if you're a historian, this guy was kind of racist. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean they, they showed, what was that movie that was shown in the White House? Um, it was a very racist movie, uh, anyway, and and he he was like thought it was a great movie. Anyway, right. uh, uh, he said to the to the League of Nations, unless it's unanimous, that we, it can't be voted through. That is, it couldn't be a majority vote of on the racial equality proposal. Well, right. this infuriated the Japanese in general, but infuriated Fujita in particular, because why would the nation say, hey, you guys are just inferior? And so the feeling was, hey, we're Major League Baseball. You guys are Little League. You will never be a Major League ball player. We're never going to let you set foot on the field. And they they took offense to that, and, and they should take offense to it. But what I didn't realize was that there were riots in Japan. I don't put all this in the book because the book would be like 5,000 pages long. <laughs> but there were riots in the street, and there were people in the street saying that, that Japan should attack the United States. This is 1919 right. and 1920. So um, when you get right down to what was the cause of the Pacific War, um, part of it was just racial prejudice and arrogance. And then when Fuchida came over to the United States on his training mission, at the time, this is like 1922, uh, Japan and the United States were allies from World War I, and we were friends. And so he, he was in the United States and walked on some U.S. battleships, which was kind of ridiculous when you read the story, because the United States were telling him all the secrets of their latest battleships, yes. how thick the steel was at the waterline. They're telling a Japanese this. Well, guess what? They go back to Japan and says, we know exactly how thick their Jap how thick the the hull of the ship is and how thick the it is at the waterline. And so they designed torpedoes specifically that would defeat the American ships. And the ships that were sunk at Pearl Harbor was from technology that the Americans had actually given to the Japanese. Anyway, when he was there in uh, San Francisco, mm -hmm. he heard the Japanese nationals and the farmers telling him, hey, you know, they're, they they don't treat us right. They're unfair to us. They won't let us be in the union. They they won't sell our stuff in the store. Right. They call back. They, they refer to us as the yellow peril, you know, and, and they, they make fun of us. They couldn't testify in court in their own defense. I mean, it was really a rigged system, and they hated it. And, and this just added fuel to the fire of, of Fuchita feeling like these guys are bad news. Uh, so you can understand it. Now, I didn't want people to identify with Fuchita to the point of they would agree right. with the surprise attack against Pearl Harbor. I just wanted people, and myself included, to understand why he did it and what his motivation was, and that had I been steeped in the same culture for my entire life, how I might feel the same way toward the United States. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up that specific point about when Fuchida comes over and he's talking to the Japanese nationals and there they've got one sob story after another. And that was like one of the 6,000 times I said to my wife, Hey honey, let's stop what you're doing and listen to this. And I read her that part of the book. She's, she's not talking to me right now, but that's a whole nother story. We'll go into that later. But uh, no, so I, I, you're right. It is, 
racial tension. It is assumed superiority. Everybody does it. And when you have that, you're not willing to compromise. You're not willing to see the other person as equal. Uh, and you're not willing to, to consider their needs. And Japan had needs just like America. But I'm so glad you put that in because America, just like every other country, you have to acknowledge your your weak points. And because if you don't, you won't ever try to improve them. So I'm glad you put America's flaws in there as well, as well as the Japanese flaws. I think it's important to stick to the truth. And it made the story that much more powerful. Yeah. And, and another thing, Ray, was along those lines, which you just said, there were redemptive characters in, in, the, in the Japanese side yes. of the story who did not want to be a part of this war at all. Mm-hmm. Zero. And they did not know what to do. And it was fortunate for me that one of these characters is in this story who was doing everything he could to prevent the Japanese from doing what they were doing. And again, when I was doing the research, coming across this character, I thought, you got to be kidding me. (laughs) This is an unbelievable story. And it's really, really amazing. I've had Japanese nationals read this book, both in English and in Japanese. And they said across the board, they felt that the treatment and the explanation of the Japanese was fair. They felt right. it was fair. And that's what I just tried to be. I didn't take sides. I'm an American, of course. But I'll tell you an interesting thing, Ray. I remember sitting in a restaurant with a Japanese national who had worked for NHK. He was in the United States now. And he he was very interested in what I was doing. And he had read the screenplay. Mm-hmm. And he said, Martin, I always knew the story of Fuchita would be told. But I knew it had to be done by an American which confused me. I thought, why do you think an American would have to do it? I don't even speak Japanese. He said, because a Japanese would never tell it right. They Uh, wouldn't do it. And I remember seeing, uh, after he said that, years later, I watched a uh, a movie on Admiral Yamamoto, a Japanese movie on him Mm -hmm. in Japanese with American English subtitles. And as I'm reading this, I mean, watching this, having read about Yamamoto's life, I'm thinking, this is absurd. They're making him into a, into a nice old grandfather who loved children and yeah. didn't want to be a part of the war, but oh, well, he got forced to blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking, no, no, no. He was the mastermind of the Pearl Harbor attack. He was the mastermind of the Midway attack. Mm-hmm. He was not going in. I mean, they call him the reluctant admiral, but that's true. But yeah. it, imagine you're standing in a traffic court before a judge and he says, well, you ran the red light and crashed this car and killed this lady. Yeah, I said, yeah. But, Your Honor, I didn't want to run the red right. light. Yeah. As you didn't want to. Right. What did you do? Exactly. I ran the red light. Okay, well, it doesn't matter what you wanted. And so Yamamoto was, anyway, all that to say is the Japanese, he said the Japanese wouldn't do it right. right. And uh, I don't know if that's true or false, but I tried to be as fair as possible toward the Japanese and as fair as possible toward the Americans, because a lot of Americans, most were really great people. But there are some really terrible people who really enjoy killing Japanese people. And I think, well, you know, that's really not a good thing. That's that's almost as bad as, as the enemy themselves. Exactly. Every society has its uh, less than favorable uh, elements, if you will. But the one, if I can go in a slightly different direction, as I'm reading this book, as I'm going through the chapters and, and, the, and it's building to, to Pearl Harbor and it's building to Midway and everything else that's that's going on, what I really, really appreciated, and you probably figured this out already, but what I really appreciated was there were so many photos. I got to watch Fuchida age. I got to watch the Covells age. I got to watch everybody age and, that, and they're going through the war and you put a ton of maps in there and that really did help with the experience because like you said, you and Google became good friends. The last thing you want to do is stop put the book down, go look on the internet, go, oh, okay, that's that, and then go back to the book. You had so much in there. I think that was part of it, why it just flowed for a lot of the readers. Yeah, I I mean, I have to credit my son with a lot of this. The first edition of the book just had maps in it because, like you, I was lost trying to figure out, you know, where is, you know, new you know, New Guinea Island. I mean, where where are these places? I, I don't know where they are. But my son said, Dad, you got to put pictures in the book. I mean, you've got these pictures. I had a lot on hand, but it was a big job. But he kept saying, Dad, more pictures, more, 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 more. So I finally collected, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of photos. Uh, the good thing was that most of them are in the public domain. If they're taken by the U.S. Army or by the Imperial Navy or Army, you know, most of these are in the public domain. And a lot of them, nobody even knows where they came from. So right. uh, I did have to buy the rights to some of these pictures, like Time Magazine, National Geographic, etc. But 
I wanted to flesh out the story so you could see it because, like I said, I'm a visual thinker. I, I can see the screenplay. That's, I mean, the movie. That's what I wrote to mm -hmm. start with. But with the book, you can describe it only so far. But when you see the picture, you go, oh, oh I see what you're talking about. And through this process, you know, I, there's over 300 photos in the book. Um, I discovered pictures that I didn't even know existed. I thought, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> right. We've got this picture. Oh, wow. That's like amazing. Even the Japanese translator who worked with me on getting the book into Japanese, and that's another story, we're going to do a big release in Japan next year. She was like, she she found pictures that I didn't know existed. We've got in the book the the actual telegraph message of Tor Tor Tor, which is not in any book I've ever heard of. I've not even heard it even existed. Right. It's in a no photo section of a museum. And we had to go through great lengths to get permission to, to put it in our book. They wanted to know if it was an anti-Japanese book. So what I did, uh, Ray, is I sent um, pictures, excuse me, I sent uh, a, a letter of endorsement from Yoko Narahashi, mm -hmm. who was the executive, or excuse me, the associate producer of The Last Samurai, starring Tom Cruise and Ken Watanabe. Right. She also produced uh, The Last Geisha and uh, the emperor about Emperor Hirohito because her grandfather was an advisor to him. Wow. Anyway, I got so many glowing reviews from Japanese nationals, they gave me permission to put it in the book. And that's the only copy I've ever seen of or heard in any book. So we did. We have a lot of pictures like that in the book that really do bring it to life. Let me ask you a question just out of my own curiosity. Yeah. One of the things that made Fuchida mad was about he felt some of the officers were being railroaded in in these trials these war crimes trials mm -hmm. and that if, if the japanese had won the war they'd be putting the, the americans to death for the exact same things when you read that story about this friend of Fuchida, what were your thoughts as you went through this trial and how it ended and the document that's in the book yeah uh no he he was absolutely right you know the victors write the history the victories the victors get to punish everybody and <sighs> I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I know what that that's the way life is. And so as he's watching his colleague, you know, be persecuted for his beliefs, just like Fujita was, you know, wanting to defend and honor his country. That was amazing. And yes, you're absolutely right. The the docket, the documents really brought everything to life and, to, and it were, they were clear enough to read. And that just made it so much more powerful for me that not only is war not fair, but what comes after war is tr equally not fair, but the victors are going to do whatever they want, and the, and the losers just kind of have to bide their time and deal with it as best they can. Yeah, so I've asked many people who've read the book, I ask them, what one scene stuck with you? And mm -hmm. I expect it to be like three or four basic scenes that were like the pinnacle of the story or a high point. But it wasn't that way at all. It was like a smorgasbord where people said, I like this, I didn't like that. One guy told me it was that court scene. Yeah. That that thing just really stuck with him. And when he when he read that part, I thought, wow. Yeah. Uh, for if I could, just for me, DeShazer, you know, he's spending most of his time, he's he's got the blindfold on, he's in solitary, he can find it most of the time. And when he's in court, he has no idea what's going on. They're speaking a foreign language. He can't really know what the documents say because they're not written in English. And you and you start to get worked, you start to worry about him, but you also get angry on his behalf because he's not being treated fairly. But again, it is war. It is a truly a true breakdown of society when the two sides are trying to kill each other. Fortunately, he survived, so we get to we get to hear his story. Yeah, it is a crazy story, uh, and he did not know what was going to happen next. On multiple occasions, he expected that they were just going to shoot him, cut his head off, whatever, because that's what they do. They killed an awful lot of people. Yeah, but uh, he did obviously survive the war. But you see his transformation and his sense of humor even in the midst of terrible situations. Um, and another thing that, that's very interesting to me that I, I really didn't expect, I, I mean, I've had a good number of women say, I just finished the book, I just picked up the Kleenex off the floor. Yes. One wrote. Another, yes. I was, remember talking to a friend of mine, he said, Martin, this is a really great book, but it really got me. I said, what do you mean, got me? He goes, well, you know, he was, he was saying he, he bawled his eyes out, you know, yes. like things hit him emotionally so everybody it hits people differently but i'll tell you honestly myself having gone through this i don't know countless times mm -hmm. it still moves me emotionally to tears when i go through this book it is it's just something about it just 
it just hits you. Yes. Yeah. No, there were definitely tissues nearby as I'm reading. Again, every time Jacob's family got a telegram, look, we don't know what's going on. You're just, you just feel for them. You were asking me some of my impressions, and I, I, I can easily see why people would give you a lot of different answers because it's based on their experience. Jacob's Correct. sense of humor was hilarious. After those three other crewmen were shot, they were executed, and and he's uh, Jacob's. If he finally gets to see someone else, uh, the first thing he says to the other guys, "Hey, how's that diet plan going?" Because they're dropping tens of pounds of weight, they're not being fed anything, and here he is being defiant and humorous at the same time. Yeah, and 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 without that, sometimes you you can't exist. I think sense of humor is a, a safety valve to keep us sane. Exactly. So I'm going to ask you, because uh, I ask every author this, but um, who do you think is going to get the most out of this book? But before you answer that, I do want to let the listeners know that if you do, if you do pick up this book and, and read it, you will get a great sense of the Japanese, Japanese perspective of the Pacific War. And that I, I really wanted to thank you for. I, I can tell that you went into intense detail, tons of research, and the the whether it was diary, you got it from diaries or, or from notes or whatever, but to be inside the inner court where the emperor is at, it really did give it a whole new flavor for me. These people were doing what they thought was right for their country, but obviously it went horribly wrong. Well, to answer your question who the book is for, mm-hmm. They say, and I think this is a good statement, a good, uh, you should write, you know, make the movie you want to watch, yeah. write the book you want to read. So I love great stories. I love true stories, but not just only true stories. But what I don't like is when I see a character doing things and I don't know why. Yes. Why are they doing that? Yeah. So I wanted to know why the characters in my story were doing what they did. Why did they do this? and not that. Mm -hmm. And so that took a lot of research. And once I started to figure these things out, I thought, okay, that makes sense. So what I did as I wrote the story is I balanced action, dialogue, and exposition. You give them just enough that they don't get bored with that, and then you go on to the next thing, uh, more action, and then you put in exposition in 1919, blah, blah, this and that. And you go, oh, I see. Okay, now I know why. So for me, that gives the, the character a three dimensions as opposed to being a cardboard cutout. They're the kind of, you know, the, the guy who gets shot and they fall off the building. Who <laughs> was he? I don't know. What's his name? I don't know. I don't care. Exactly. Don't care. Give it but context. With these characters, you get yeah. to know who they are, what makes them tick, why they're there, what, how many sacrifices they made. And then now it looks like they're just going to be shot. And you're thinking, well, that's terrible because now you care about that person. Exactly. So that's what I tried to do. So who the story is for is, to be honest, I wrote it for myself as far as I wanted, I wanted to see it on the screen. This is the kind of movie I would want to see the way I want to see it. But on a much deeper level and very honestly, yeah. I thought, you know what? These people who endure such terrible circumstances, who made it to the other side, it's inspiring by the definition of the word inspire. You know, it, it makes you think, well, you know what? I can't afford a full set of tires for my car. I can only afford two tires. How am I going to get out of this? It's like, well, dude, this guy was being tortured to death with no hope, but things went well for him. So the fact is, I want people to have some sense of hope that, you know what, God's real. He cares about people. Give him a shot. You know, that's what that's what Fuchita did. That's what uh, DeShazer did. That's what anyone can do. Help me. I need help. We're all in that position at one time or another. And to see it actually work out, especially in a situation where you think, how could anything good come out of this thing? I don't see right. how that could happen. And then at the end, you're thinking, golly, this is unbelievable yeah. how this all comes together. That's what I want people to take away. So to be honest, I've tested this story with male, female, old, young, people who are super religious, people who actually one guy's ahead of an atheist club read the book and said, man, he really enjoyed it. Yeah. I'm thinking, okay, well, how is that? Well, because it applies to universals. If somebody takes off their shirt and breaks through the ice and saves somebody, we don't say, excuse me. Are you an atheist or are you a Buddhist or are you? I mean, we don't care about any exactly. of that. We just said, man, congratulations. Get, let me give you a hand. Get out of here. Get this guy warmed up. It's something good we can all affirm. So when someone in like in this story goes from breathing and living, dripping hatred mm-hmm. to forgiving others and apologizing and making things right and loving their enemy, however you get there, however you get there, I think everyone will say, you know what, that's a good destination. 
Absolutely. I could not agree more. And we could all use a little more of that and hope in, in, the, in this world, especially the way things are uh, today. So again, I just want to thank you for the story for this book. I cannot stress to the audience how well crafted it is. I, if you, I don't know when you buy it, but don't start reading it until Saturday morning because you're probably going to be, you're going to need the weekend. You're going to ignore your family. You're going to ignore everybody else. And you're just going to go through the story. That's exactly what happened to me. But, but uh, that's just my two cents. So before I had, a, I, had yeah. a guy, I had a guy tell me he called in work. He said, I'm not coming in for lunch. I kid you not. I, I can see that. I can see that. So before I let you go, I, and maybe I should have did this at the very beginning. So what is the meaning of the title of the book, Wounded Tiger? Yeah, great question. So the famous uh, World War II movie, Tora, 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 mm-hmm. uh, that's the code word that Puchita sent back to the fleet indicating they achieved complete surprise all the way to Pearl Harbor, which no one believed they were actually going to do. They right. expected to be caught and be picked off all the way in. They expected to lose half of their aircraft. They only lost 29 planes out of 360. Anyway, so that tour, tour, tour is tiger, tiger, tiger. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. And Fuchida was born in the year of the tiger, so uh, Fuchida was the tiger. But a tiger is a creature of great power and beauty. I mean, you've seen them in, in the zoo. They're just awesome. Their paws are giant. Their teeth, like golly, they can crush a car. You know, right. you're just thinking, what an amazing and gorgeous creature. Mm-hmm. And, and so Fuchida wanted to be a great warrior. He wanted to be a part of a great nation. But all that came tumbling down. It just turned all to rubble and ash, as it was in Hiroshima. So he was a wounded tiger. He could not achieve his goals. And uh, then out of that situation, he ultimately becomes that triumphant tiger. So the wounded tiger, of course, is Fuchida. It's the nation of Japan. But in the end, everyone is a wounded tiger. We all have potential for great things. There's things we have ambitions for, but then things happen in our lives. Maybe we've made terrible choices. Maybe somebody's done something to us that's awful. And you think my life will never recover from this. It's impossible. Right. And I I want people to know that that's not true. Everybody can have a great future. And when you see it work out in these situations that are like a hundred times worse than anything you'll ever go through, they made it. Well, so can you. I want people to have that hope. So uh, I wrote the story not to make money. I've turned down literally millions of dollars in offers on the film. Mm -hmm. What excites me is if a person reads the book, I'll tell you this is a a true story. I like true stories. Here's a true story. (laughs) A woman read the book. Uh, She told me she didn't think she was going to like it at all. I said, you don't need to like it. Just, you know, read a few pages and see what you think. Uh, She read the book. I took her and her husband out to dinner. We had a great time together just having fun. And then at one point, she just took her glasses off. Tears streaming down her cheeks. She said, Martin, I got to tell you, um, this really hit me hard. It impacted my life deeply because I've always hated my mom. She was so nasty. She would lock us in the basement. We'd scream and cry and pound on the door. She was just evil. And I hated my mom. And yeah, she told me her mom was still alive at the time. She said, I still hate my mom. Mm -hmm. She said, when I saw how these people loved each other, I realized I must be a better person. I need to be a better person. And I thought, you know, that's a great that's a great place to be because you can't be a better person until you realize you need to be a better person. And I'm still in touch with her today and we're we're great friends. So, uh, I think that's wounded tiger is all about becoming a triumphant tiger. That is an incredible answer. I'm glad I got this thing on record. No, I'd really love that because, yeah, by the time, not only are you bereft because this has been an emotional roller coaster, but you do have that hope. You do see people turning their lives around, getting help and not just doing it themselves, but there's something else out there that can help them. So, Mr. Bennett, again, thank you for this book. This was an incredible read. I cannot stress that enough. So for everyone else out there, it's Wounded Tiger, the true story of the pilot who led the Pearl Harbor attack, whose life was changed by an American prisoner and by the girl he never met. Um, if you go to WoundedTiger.com, anyone can read the first chapters free. Right. And it'll also have information on the film side because I do have a uh, liaison to a billionaire who's interested in putting some money into the picture. So we are definitely going to do the film. I don't have the money yet, but we will. Right. But I'm telling you, Ray, if you reach out to me, once we're going into principal photography, I will make sure 
that you have at least uh, the ability to serve coffee to the director. That That's all I want. That's all I want. Thank you, sir. You are the nicest. Uh, Mr. Bennett, thank you for this book. Thank you for this, this time. And I will be watching your journey because I cannot wait to have a big bag of popcorn and watch this in the movie theater. Thank you very much, sir. We'll get it done. Thank you so much for having me on your show, Ray. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 447, part B, Hitler versus his generals. Last time, the Panzers of Armor Group Center had stopped a Soviet counterattack in between Minsk and Smolensk, creating a third major pocket of trapped Soviet troops. And even better, the way to Smolensk was open. The first pocket near Bielystok was no longer a threat. But now there was an even larger pocket just west of Minsk, and another was forming just west of Smolensk, as the Panzers of Hoth to the north and Guderian's Panzers to the south were swinging in, wide and fast. Berlin expected Smolensk to go the way of Minsk, as did Moscow. Which is all another way of saying Field Marshal Fedor von Bock, Army Group Center's commander, was the man of the hour. Perhaps all this would be over by Christmas. Either way, on the last day of June, von Bock was ordered by OKH to prepare to continue operations in the direction of Smolensk. He was only too happy to oblige, as were his panzer commanders, Hoth and Guderian. So, it will come as no surprise that both Hoth and Guderian, as they had done previously, kept their panzers moving closer to either side of Smolensk. Again, Hitler wanted the Minsk pocket, like the Bielystok pocket, destroyed first, before the Panzers moved on. But the majority of German officers knew that victory was only possible by keeping the Russians reacting to the attackers, to them, never having a real chance of establishing a defense in depth out in front of Moscow. And every time the marching German infantry reached a pocket, more Panzers were released, not by Hitler, but by the Panzer commanders. Indeed, Guderian, and to a lesser extent Hoth, let all know who would listen that Moscow had to be their prime target, period. When it fell, and it would, they would see to it, the enemy would be in chaos and unable to use this linchpin of a city that was the Soviet capital to carry on their defenses. Soviet defenses would crumble, and victory was as assured as anything could be. However, Stalin, Timoshenko, nor Zhukov knew of the differing offensive philosophies between Hitler and his panzer commanders. They assumed, based on what was happening on the ground, that Berlin's main goal was to reach and take Moscow. Hence, they would continue to throw in men and pour armies into the path of Army Group Center, to the point that it would weaken the other Soviet fronts. And yet, the battles that had just taken place at Lapel, Borisov, Bobruinsk, and at Rokecha further south should not have taken place, according to German intelligence. Just before Timoshenko's counterattack got underway, though it all ended in failure, the Germans truly believed that they had destroyed the vast majority of enemy units between them and Moscow, which helps explain Hoth's panzers being so far apart from each other. At the moment, his 39th Panzer Corps was near Viptesk, while his 57th Panzer Corps was closer to Polosk, northwest of Viptesk. In other words, they were too far apart for mutual support should an attack come from the Soviets. So when the Soviet counterattack came, with the idea of not only destroying the panzers, but separating Hoth's and Guderian's leading panzers, fortunately for the Germans, the Soviets, though motivated, were untried and either could not fight in an organized and therefore focused fashion, or simply ran away, as had happened before near Rogetchev in the south. Point is, this latest Soviet push failed, and the road to Smolensk was open. 
But now the Germans had to be asking themselves, well, what else is waiting for us in Smolensk and beyond? Clearly, the enemy has resources we did not count upon. But now that the Germans had dealt themselves these cards, they had to play them out as best they could. For example, just two days before Timoshenko's failed counterattack, Army Group Center was told that the Soviets had 11 divisions in front of them. In reality, it was 66 divisions, 24 in front of the immediate German threat and 37 further behind them. And as we have seen, the Germans handled this unexpected massive counterattack well enough. Still, the Soviets had given them a few moments of doubt. Like when the Soviet 5th and 7th Mechanized Corps slammed into the 39th Panzer Corps, the idea had been to split Hoth's panzers from Guderian's. When the Soviets smashed into the panzers, the 7th Panzer Division was driven back some 20 miles, or 32 kilometers, which affected three other panzer divisions near them, who had to fall back to keep the line straight. But in time, the Soviets exhausted themselves, and German air power and artillery took out over 800 Soviet tanks, thus blunting this large Soviet counterattack. As the beaten Soviet units retreated back to Smolensk, they did notice that when the panzers dashed out ahead, their flanks were unprotected. Obviously, the Germans were hoping that constant movement would keep them safe, but this was something the Stavka would remember for later. In other areas, rain made the roads harder to use, and the plethora of rivers to cross now came into the fore especially with the Soviet troops on the other side of the river, waiting. Oh, these defenders would be chased off and the rivers crossed, but it slowed down the drive, and the Germans kept losing men each time they engaged. Victorious, but a bit weaker each time, is one way to describe the Germans' dash ever eastward. Still, Smolensk was next. The plan to capture this major city was added on to the idea of creating and then destroying another large Soviet pocket. If they had more troops than Berlin, well, this was the best way to destroy them most efficiently. Hence, the opening move was to have the 2nd Panzer Group, later to be transformed into the 2nd Panzer Armor, to cross the Dnieper River and come at the target city from the south. Meanwhile, the 3rd Panzer Group, again to become an army later, was to finish the encirclement by coming from the north. As we have seen on July 6th, the Soviet 5th and 7th Mechanized Corps launched their attack near Lapel, but the anti-tank defenses of the 7th Panzer Division made short work of this attempt. Meanwhile, to the south, Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group launched a surprise attack across the Dnieper on July 10th. Soon, he was only 18 kilometers, or 11 miles, from Smolensk. Moscow could guess easily enough that the enemy was aiming for another encirclement, so rushed the counterattacks in another uncoordinated fashion. To help out, or rather, to make sure that the two other German army groups did not assist here, the Stavka ordered offenses against army groups north and south, and the Germans noticed this, Not that it meant much to them. Bothered would be too strong a word for how the Germans felt about this attempt. Still, Moscow was making the attempt. With Viptesk falling, the 7th Panzer Division with the 20th Panzer Division drove on eastward and by July 15th were at Yatsevo, about 60 kilometers or 96 miles northeast of Smolensk. In other words, they were past the city. As this drive was underway, the 29th Motorized Division, backed by the 17th Panzer Division, drove into Smolensk proper and took most of the city. But there would be another week of house-to-house fighting. And with the Soviet 16th Army busy fighting for the city, some of Guderian's panzers, in the form of the 2nd SS Panzer Division, Das Reich, was doing the same thing in the south, pushing past Smolensk, And in fact, they reached the city of Elnia on the Nisa River, about 80 kilometers east by southeast of Smolensk. And then Hitler stepped in with his military genius. 
Issuing Directive Number 33 on July 19th, it stated that Moscow was no longer the primary objective and that once the Smolensk pocket had been reduced, Army Group Center would give its panzer groups to the other two Army Groups. Specifically, 3rd Panzer Group's 57th Panzer Corps was to head north and help push against Soviet forces to the east and southeast of Leningrad. And the 39th Panzer Corps was to also head north to assist in the actual encirclement of that major Soviet city. Meanwhile, 2nd Panzer Group was to head south and help 1st Panzer Group of Army Group South in crossing the South Dnieper River to take and hold Ukraine. It will come as no surprise that Halder, the OKH Chief of Staff, Yodel, the OKW Chief of Staff, Von Bock, Army Group Center's commander, Hoth and Guderian were completely against this. But it was a directive from Hitler. It could not be ignored, and it wasn't. But it was certainly tinkered with. First, some staff officers delayed implementing this directive. Next, there were plans to reorganize the panzers so that they would be ready to continue the march on Moscow when the directive's objectives were met, or in other words, an excuse to keep some of the panzers where they were. But Hitler would not fall for this. As Hitler told the various staffs, his generals, they knew nothing about the economic aspects of war, that Leningrad had to be secured so the iron ore going to Sweden could be maintained, that the Ukraine had to be secured to provide raw materials and agricultural produce Germany would need for a long war. And lastly, by taking the Crimea, the Russian Air Force would not be able to reach the vital oil fields at Ploesti in Romania. Again, the German officers might have disagreed and have valid points, but Hitler was also right on certain points. First, the line of engagement now looked like an S, as Hoth and Guderian had been doing their own thing, leaving the infantry to tag along as best they could. Besides, by now, all kinds of equipment needed attention and replacing, and the men certainly needed a rest, specifically the walking infantry. Sensing Army Group Center's Lack of enthusiasm for Directive Number 33, Commander-in-Chief of the High Command of the Army, Walter von Braulich, flew out to Borisov for a conference. Well, more like a lecture. He basically said, follow the directive or suffer the consequences. He ended with, do not push any further east. Soon the lecture, I mean meeting, ended, and Guderian got Hoth to agree with him to delay this change as long as possible, i.e. releasing the panzers in question. Strangely, these two men were helped by the Soviets, in that Smolensk was mostly controlled by the Germans, but not completely. The encirclement to the east of the city was almost closed, but not completely. Timoshenko had told the newly promoted Roskovsky to get the Soviet troops out of Smolensk pronto, but instead of retreating east, He was to hold the Eastern Gap open for as long as possible. Why? Because the Soviets had figured out by now that the Germans would not do much else until this pocket was closed. As the newly created armies started flowing into the area, Rokozovsky, like those before him, went over on the offensive, attacking the German troops around Smolensk, but not so much inside of it because the NKVD had gathered up just over 100,000 males in the city and made them engage the Germans, again now down to -to house-to-house fighting. The Soviets attacking certainly had the numbers, but not the coordination or logistics to maximize a staggering punch. The attack started on July 21st, and though the panzers had to race here and there, they put out the Soviet fires and found themselves more in control of the surrounding area. By July 30th, the last of the Soviet attacks were pushed away and the encirclement closed. Now, inside the Smolensk pocket was the 16th and 20th Soviet armies. However, the encirclement wasn't perfect and the Soviet 20th Army led a breakout at the circle's weakest point to the east of Smolensk. 
In the next few days, only 50,000 Soviet troops managed to escape, but the Russians were getting better at this. And the Germans, not so much, as their power was being diffused in trying to answer the call of Hitler while appeasing the most basic tenets of warfare, not to let oneself get overrun or surrounded. On August 5th, von Bock announced to the world, as far as the Battle of Smolensk was concerned, it was mission accomplished. And he had 302,000 POWs, just over 3,000 tanks and 3,000 guns, and over 1,000 aircraft to prove it. Overjoyed, Hitler flew to Army Group Center's headquarters personally to thank von Bock and his men. And then he ruined it all by saying the dispersion of Army Group Center's panzers would proceed as ordered. Next, he semi-revolved Hoth and Guderian by saying he did also approve a limited offensive around the just-captured city of Yelnia, located about 30 miles or 48 kilometers east by southeast of Smolensk. Drawing a line that goes north to south about 10 miles east of Smolensk, the Germans had already captured, again going north to south, Yartsedfo, though that had been a slog and a half, and Solavio. But then the line bulges a bit further east to encompass Yelnia, before heading back to the southwest to Roslavi. This last city, Guderian had taken personally and forcefully to show that the defenses between Smolensk and Moscow were weak, thus the advance should continue. This limited allowance by Hitler cheered von Bock, Hoth, and Guderian, who believed that once Yelnia was bypassed, the Russians had very little left in front of Moscow. So, if they could push on from Yelnia, they could then press on to Moscow, even if that meant with fewer tanks, infantry, and artillery. And by the time they got close to the capital, hopefully, all their panzers would be returned to them to finish off this war in the east. But Stalin had just now ordered Zhukov to destroy the Yelnia salient, so the Germans would try to operate from that city while the Russians sought to recapture it. Another clash was in the offing. But then the Soviets were given a gift by the god of war. Much of von Richthofen's Second Flieger Corps was to be sent to help harass Leningrad into submission. This coming German limited offensive from Yelnia would not have the normal air cover. However, the truth was Berlin was stunned by its own successes. Besides a few hiccups and moments of panic when units had to be rushed here and there, the war in the East was going better than anyone expected. Problem was, this created doubt in many Germans' mind. What were they missing? And still having the remainder of Western Russia before them, many simply did not know how to wrap this up. And in that moment of indecision, cracks would appear between Hitler, the OKW, the High Command of the Armed Forces, and the OKH, Army High Command, much less the commanders in the field. This would peak and go on between mid-July and mid-August. But as August came to a close, Hitler would win out in his battle of wills with these stuffed shirt generals. Besides, Hitler could see for himself that the men needed a rest. They weren't getting resupplied adequately, and each time there was a salient, thanks to the eager panzer commanders, the men inside of that salient were constantly being counterattacked, which took time and resources to defend against. No, the Fuhrer wanted the situations in the north and the south of Army Group Center cleaned up before the dash to Moscow could continue. But who knows if all went well, the dash that Guderian was so looking forward to might not be needed at all. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, sorry this took so long, but the season tis upon us. 
And I've been, you know, Christmas shopping, telling people what I want for Christmas, making sure they get it right, beating them up when they don't, and watching them do it again. Anyway, typical Christmas family stuff. So I would like to say hello to the latest members and those who have donated. Let's see here, latest members. And this is not everybody up to this point because I got a, a little splurge in the last day or so and I'd already recorded this. So I will get to you. I will thank you as is proper. So just bear with me. Uh, let's see here. Newest members. Let's see here. Eli Vanderlei from Lansing, Michigan. Um, he emailed me as well. Uh, thank you very much, Eli. Uh, Martin Nikolai from Keswick, Ontario, Canada. Thank you, Martin. Um, Mark Stayan, who I think has donated before, Spalding, Lincolnshire, UK. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Douglas Mogul from Palm City, Florida. Douglas I don't know what your weather is right now, but it's got to be better than here in Central Virginia, so you enjoy that. Uh, let's see here. Walter Stotts from Lambertville, Michigan, I believe. Joseph, is it Iovine? I'm sure, Joseph, I just butchered that. I'm so sorry. From Brewster, New York. Um, Richard Willers from Ramsey. Is that Minnesota? Yeah, let's go with that, Richard, Minnesota. And if I'm wrong, if you could just move to the other state that starts with an M, that would really help me out. Um, and the last one, Priscilla Forney from Greensboro, North Carolina. So thank you all very much for becoming members. For five bucks a month, you get two extra episodes. Um, so again, it is very much pre- appreciated. Uh, as far as donations, I have two. There's Vinny Tradisi. Uh, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, but Vinny, I think, became a member and donated, so he is now my new best friend. Thank you very much, Vinny. And lastly, as far as donations, there's Eden Matthews. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it. I will be um, working through the holiday season because I want to keep this going and get back up to where we were, and then we'll slow down and go into detail and watch the various Army groups as they think they're about to achieve greatness and end the war in the East. We'll see how that goes. I don't want to ruin the ending for anybody. Take care, everyone. Selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... As easy as pie? Sure. All you have to do is enter your license plate or VIN. As easy as a stroll in the park. Okay. Then just answer a few questions and you'll get a real offer in seconds. As easy as singing. Why not? Schedule a pickup or drop off and Carvana will pay you that amount right on the spot. As easy as playing guitar. Actually, I find that kind of difficult. But selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... Can be. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get an instant offer today.